morning. Good morning. Good morning. There it is. The show's about to begin. Please, everybody, take your seats. This is your last call. And we're live from the morning. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Good? All right. So I want to read the scripture to start. This is one of the scriptures that we had for House of Prayer on Friday. It's Galatians 5, verse 1. In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held and snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. Uh, I've been thinking about what happened in House of Prayer on Friday. It was a really good time and the presence of the Lord here, you know, we were moving and I don't remember some things that happened, so <laughs> you can imagine how good it was. Anyway, uh, I've been, I've been thinking about, you know, before we come to know the Lord or when we're starting, uh, this is something that my mom sent me a, a, a picture of, and I want to show it to you. This is how we came in. <laughs> Friday night before we started. This is how we came out. <laughs> we <laughs> the Lord prepares us to face this world without any fear. We can go anywhere and he will shine through us and people will come to know him and people will come to him and little by little all of his children all of those that he's calling will come to him that's what I believe is happening for this church we might see empty spaces in the pews physically but spiritually this place is packed right now we're just waiting for those that have already heard that call to take that first step of faith and come in here. Uh, kind of a, a testimony of, of how I think the Lord is using me to minister to other people. I have this friend at work that we've had conversations about God and she's always said that he doesn't exist. We don't get into arguments or anything, but as I've gone through my journey that I started two years ago, and I have grown and have had things revealed to me and, and all that, sh her spirit started to pick up on those things. So we were talking about Valentine's Day yesterday, and and she told I, um, this was on Friday, and, and she told me, you know what? I'm just going to hang out with my sister and some friends and whatnot, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be crying at the end of the night. I said, all right. And she said, would you pray for me? And that was a shock for me because first she denied the existence of God. Then we were talking about a promise, and... Her response was, well, he's never promised to me. So now her mentality changed from God doesn't exist to, yeah, he exists, but he didn't, hasn't promised me anything. So I told her, yeah, we're going to have house of prayer tonight, so I'll lift you up. And she said, yeah, God might not know who you're praying for because him and I haven't been on good terms for a long, long, long time. So now, as you see, it's changing. And I told her, you know what? I believe that you and I are walking a path that we're supposed to walk together because you have been and you will be a blessing to me. 
and I will be to you. So I cannot wait to see what's going to happen in this girl's life. Um, you know, I've, I've, I'm going through a difficult trial, but I'm not curled up in the corner. Please, God, take me away from this misery. I'm just letting it happen the way he wants it to happen. I'm just submitting to his word, believing what he said. And I came as a kitty on Friday night, and now I'm a lion. So <laughs> it's all good in the name of the Lord. And with that, I open the floor for questions. So that's going to be my catchphrase from now on. Anyone has a testimony or prayer request? Yes.
situation, get her out of there to a place where she can serve God and, yeah. and develop that relationship because she does love the Lord. And uh, we've been with her um, every every place she's ever gone. We've visited her. We've gone down even in bad weather. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a few Sundays ago. We we drove down there and got with just just getting down there and, and and seeing her. So we're just gonna believe God because that's why the Bible starts the way it does. In the beginning, God. That's where it all starts at. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and Jesus says it's my Alpha and Omega, the beginning yes. and the ending. Yes. And always built yes. the Bible frames itself. Mm-hmm. You know, starts in the beginning, and Jesus says on the ending. So if we stay in between there, yeah. we'll be all right. Yeah. 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 So I just want to thank God. Amen. that I guess he was incarcerated but anyways I haven't seen him in like six months and over the summer because uh, he got placed in well he came out of the water and he got out of one or a studio apartment over in West Des Moines and so uh, he was going back to the partying and drinking and, and he I stopped by him that Friday to see him and he said that he he's done well Leery about that because he didn't want to lose his benefits and stuff. But you know, um, I, I I haven't seen Kevin in many years. You know, he he told me one time I, at the Y, I said, yeah, I see you praying with for your blessing on the food. And he said, yeah, but he said, you know what? He said God's been back with me, and so it was so hopeful. He's just he's just been a great friend and, and I just praise God for you know my experience with the Y, you know. So I just praise Kevin. And the Lord. Amen. The Lord lead him and uh, um, the Lord gave me a vision the other day that he'd be coming here to visit me. So wow. I just think he's right. <laughs> supposed to be there by record an hour and a half. A lot of times I'm there four hours. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that's God. So some people might take this as I'm bragging on myself and I'm not. I'm bragging on God because oh, I didn't yeah. open the door. I didn't create the situation. Um, I'm not able to do anything with myself, but through Christ, everything. Amen? Oh, yeah. uh, doors that are open. Um, pray, pray for uh, Lacey Woods. Um, this family, she's 19 years old. She's been in hospitals everywhere and they're not sure what week I was, I was traveling too, I was listening to, you know, different radio shows, and I don't know if it was, if it was Joyce Myers or who it was, but she was talking about, you know, um, her, herself, as far as where she came when that was, it was who it was, and, uh, and I posted this about, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar, like if you're in uh, high school, college, whatever, uh, uh, sports, um, sometimes not everybody makes the traveling squad, so only um, in that sense, you know, the better players make the traveling squad. Well, in this case, if you look at the traveling squad that Jesus picked, there ain't a single one of them that had a resume that would indicate that they were worthy to be on the traveling squad. 
our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record of sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious life God willed for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be, and he did it by means of Jesus Christ. So I know for a fact that the doors are open because I read it in Scripture. Um, I have a, uh, an opportunity to uh, preach at, uh, I think it's United Church of Christ, wh whichever it is, it doesn't matter. Religion is irrelevant to me. The truth is relevant. Yeah. Yeah. And the doors that are opening, I'm just thankful for it. And I just pray for continued blessing. Uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, dad and stepmom are here. They're going to be traveling back home today. Just uh, pray for them as well.
But it's a light in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And whenever we do our, um, we don't get up here very often, so when we do, one of our favorite things is knowing that we're going to get to come back <laughs> mm -hmm. and see you all. You all make us feel welcome. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit's definitely here. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thankful to the Holy Spirit because he leads us into all truth and, and he led us to this church and, and thankful for this church because this church has, has showed us, you know, it, it's interesting because we know that God loves us, but we always put conditions around that to a certain extent because that's what religion and everything's taught us. And so, you know, it's been a journey for us in, in learning that God will do things for us and that God wants to do things for us here, here in this church. So, so what's rather interesting is just kind of every, how everything's lining up. I know Pastor recently, one Wednesday night, and it's hard for us to get here Wednesday nights because of work, but had preached on John 15, which is actually one of my favorite chapters in, in the Bible. Because the Lord, 19 years ago at the Pensacola Brownsville Revival, gave me John 15, 16 as, as a word for me. But it, it's interesting because, um, you know, we had another God appointment before he brought this other teaching into our life, which, which is a great teaching, but we got these CDs, have been listening to them, and mysteriously they disappeared. This was about a, two years ago. Never found them, turned the house upside down, can't find them. Ordered another set to replace them, that set's disappeared, except for one CD that I had in my truck. So that CD was all about what Nathan's been preaching on, which is abiding in the vine. Mm -hmm. And so the Holy Spirit's been leading me 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon to, to go out to the truck and start abiding in the vine. And what he keeps showing me is, you know, when we get worked all up thinking that we have to do something or we get stressed out about something, I, I'm one of these people that I used to, and I, I still do every now and then, I'll work through a whole conversation I'm going to have with somebody if it's going to be a difficult conversation or something that I'm going to have to work through. We, I've got a very difficult manager to work for, and so I'll work through that. But the Lord's been showing me that if I'm getting stressed out and starting to think through that stuff, then I'm not trusting him. And so... You know, it's, it's all about, you know, God, this is easy. I'm going to rest in you. I'm abiding in the vine. You know, and, and another thing I've been been asking the Lord for, you know, a lot of times we, we learn how to worship and praise based upon how we see others do it. But, you know, they may be right or wrong. We don't know what's in their hearts. So I've been asking the Lord also about, you know, how do, how, what does it mean to praise you? What does it mean to worship you? And, you know, he's been showing me, you know, that I praise him for what he does, but I worship him. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love this church, because this church is one of the only churches I know of that teaches who God really is Come to on. us. Come on. You know, we, we, we don't believe he'll help us. We don't believe what he'll heal this person. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've prayed for, I can't tell you how many sick people. And, and most of them don't get better. They haven't gotten better. <clears throat> and a lot of times, you know, I think to myself, well, maybe it's I don't have the gift of healing. But, you know, we know in the word that Jesus healed all that were brought to him. All that we're afflicted. So it's not a problem with God. It's a problem with me or a problem with how I perceive God. And I'm just thankful because, you know, and I just pray that Pastor Nathan will continue to be led by the Holy Spirit to just open up these revelations of, of who God really needs to be in this time. Because, you know, church is for us to prepare in this hour, two hours, for the rest of the week to go out and touch the rest of the world with the love of the Lord. Yeah. And, and, and that's perverted. People don't get what the love of God is to them and what he wants to be and what he is to them. So I'm, I'm thankful for all the truth that we've learned here. Uh, and on another side note, I mean, since coming here, um, just before I originally came here, I was almost 240 pounds. And I weighed myself this morning. I'm down to 179.6. So, I mean, and, and that's, again, people will ask me, what am I doing differently? I'm not, I'm not doing anything differently. I'm just being led by God and letting his peace fill every every sector of my life. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, Lord. presented in this room. Father, we ask of those that are in need of healing, we declare right now in your mighty name, Jesus, that that healing is manifested at this very moment. All of those that are being oppressed spiritually right now, Lord, in your name, we bind any spirit that is preventing these people to come
come to you and know who you are. Father, we ask that you reunite all of those that are separated, the ones that are lost, that you bring them back to where they're supposed to be. We thank you, Father, for choosing us to go out into this world. Declare your word, Lord. Show who you are to others so they come to see and know what has been revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the finished words of the cross, for giving us your word, a word that we speak and declare over our lives, over the lives of others around us, a word that we know that is true. Father, we continue to believe in you and your promises, and we know that no matter what comes against us, have prepared us to be lions going out into this world and face anything that is thrown our way. You are the foundation of our lives, Lord. And the storms come and it's withstanding whatever is doing. Thank you, Father, for your healing, for your provision, for your wisdom. Continue, Holy Spirit, to reveal to those in here and those that are not here it is that you are trying to say. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together. And as Peter said, we are being prepared through your word to go out into this world and face it. You are our shield. You are our protector. Lead the way, Father. have any announcements, so let's speak the word. Would you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I'm not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Donnie and John, would you mind taking the offering, please? Raise your hand and all hands. Come on, anyone of you guys got DVD 
player, just take it home, bring it back whenever you're done with it. If you need to share it with other people, do it. Okay? It's really good. John, would you mind saying the blessing, please? Let's worship. Church, church.
We worship you, Lord. Is Jamie still up here? What were the things that, what did you see in here Friday night? Thank you. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has eyes, let him see. That which the enemy tried to cause for destruction in this parking lot is turned out for God's glory. For our brother in Christ is with our King of kings and Lord of lords this day. victory is ours. It's time to claim it. It's time to claim it. It's time to claim it. It's all about you, Lord. Let that spout fill this place, Lord. Let it bust the doors wide open. Let it go through the windows, out into the highways and the byways. To whom those whom you are drawing here and of the places where your glory dwells, we just want more of you, Lord. Turn the heavy hearts and the joy. Turn the morning into dancing. You who are the carrier and the lifter of our heads. It's all about you, Lord. If it wasn't, we'd pack up and go home. When we come together, Lord, to dwell as brothers and sisters, because you said where two or three are gathered, there you are also. We want to celebrate what you have done, the victory that you have done. We want to celebrate, Lord, and learn this day the kingdom that you put it within us, Lord. The kingdom that you have put within us, Lord, teach us how to release that kingdom to a lost and dying world. Teach us, Lord. Rain down. Rain down. Rain down. One, two, three, four.
tonight. Verse 1. The sky is heaven. Feels like the wind. I'm going to
shout praise God thank you Lord thank you Lord glory to God glory to God praise God praise God God bless you you may be seated thank you Jesus before we get into the actual message this morning I was reading in Ezekiel in fact I read the book of Ezekiel here last week that's you know, you're supposed to say, that was really good. That's really good you did that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But uh, i got to tell you, reading through Ezekiel can get pretty depressing. If you haven't read it lately, you may want to start at the back and work. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because it's all about God's anger at sin and uh, how he then relates to Israel. Because remember, Israel had already told the Lord, Whatever you command, we will do it. You know, they, they had bought into this law thing. And so God was holding them uh, directly accountable. And because of that, there's just, you know, one bad news from God after another. But what was interesting to me was, uh, you know, you can start reading that and you begin to forget that God's always been a God of grace. He's always been a God of love. He didn't change when he got to the New Testament. It's just that under the dispensation, under the, the contract that he had with Israel, there was a demand, and then there was retribution for the 
inability to keep that or to do that. So the, whatever the law commanded, they had to do it or else they were going to be held accountable as a result of it, which is why he gave the animal sacrifices and so on and so forth. But uh, just tremendous judgment. And then you get to uh, chapter 37. And he, he's describing Israel as just a bunch of dead, dry bones. And then he begins to speak. The Holy Spirit begins to speak to it. And these bones begin to put on ligaments and muscle and flesh. And they rise up a great army. And immediately the Lord spoke to me in my heart, you know, and said, this is exactly what happens when a person gets born again. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. The Holy Spirit, nobody comes to the Lord except the Spirit draws them. And the Spirit comes and begins to speak life. We're quickened, the Scripture says, by His Spirit. We're made alive. So with all of the negative that you read in the first 36 chapters of, of uh, Ezekiel, it's all leading up to something God wants. He's telling them over and over, look, you're failing. In fact, it talks about it over and over. The righteous person, when they stop doing righteous, they're going to be judged for the unrighteousness. Whatever righteousness they did, it's like it never happened. <laughs> right? I mean, you could be really good and then just screw up one day, and you're toast. That's what legalism does. That's what religion does, and that's what the law does. It tells you it's all about what you do. Well, you didn't give yourself life. When you get born again, when you trust in the Lord, which is what being born again is, when you trust in him, in his sacrifice, you're given life, God life immediately. Amen. Has nothing to do with what you have done. You were dead. You were off. But all of a sudden now you've become alive to God. And because God initiated it, God keeps it. That's why he's the author and finisher of our faith. He begins the work in you. He carries it right on through, like Brother Tim was saying this morning. He's the alpha. He's the omega. The good news is, and he's everything in between. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches us. Religion wants us to be about us. The moment it becomes about us, it becomes a story of failure. It becomes a story of, uh, of uh, degradation and condemnation and guilt and shame. As long as the focus is on him, we're victorious. Amen. He makes us alive. He keeps us alive forevermore, the scripture says. We're, we, if you're born again, you've done all the dying you're going to do. Glory. Amen? Amen? Your flesh may go one way or another if the Lord tarries, but you, who you are, the you that's alive to God, the, cre the, the, the created image of God, which is your spirit, because God is a spirit, is alive forever. And we'll never die. Hallelujah. It becomes one with God. God can't die. How are you going to die? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. And while Sheila's pulling that up, then we're going to do Galatians 4.19, Sheila. So it's Romans 8.29. And then Galatians 4.19. If you all notice this uh, piece of artwork up here? <laughs> it actually looks like what's behind the walls where, you know, the original building was kind of done uh, during the Depression. It was actually built in the 30s, I think. But uh, they just, it was a bring your lumber one day and they decided to build a building. But the reason for that is Sally's... Uh, making a curtain, a backdrop to go across the back of this so that when they do the video DVDs and so forth, it won't wash out here. Plus, it's a little bit of a, a uh, acoustical enhancement as well. So if you're wondering why that strange looking piece of wood up there, it's hopefully by next week, it'll be, there'll be a curtain up there. Hallelujah. And uh, you can, you all pray for me because I've prayed through about three times since she started this curtain. I got the victory. She's still struggling, but I got the victory. Hallelujah. 
anyway, it's a big job to do on a little sewing machine in our kitchen. And, uh, but she's getting her done, praise the Lord. So I appreciate her volunteering for it and coming through. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Naturally, I had to go backwards. I want to start at Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What I want to draw your attention to is that we are to be, he predestinated us, he determined before the foundation of the world we were in Christ. God knows the end from the beginning, he's outside of time, so this isn't about predestination like, you know, uh, uh, some believe, but it's, it's just God simply knows who is and who isn't. So he doesn't make it happen, he just knows. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, now Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. So everything, you know, much of what we've talked about this morning has been about, you know, kind of evangelism or our way of reaching out to other people, touching other people's lives and and that's really kind of what I want to talk to you about this morning. But as a, as a preacher, uh, I, uh, I've been misunderstood. <laughs> that sounds like something right out of the 60s, doesn't it? I'm still trying to find myself, but without the help of drugs, it's difficult, i got to tell you. Praise the Lord. But anyway, have you ever, have you ever uh, been taken out of context you know, I mean, uh, have you had your actions misunderstood? Right? Or, or your associations judged? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, here's the deal. You can't, you can't control other people's perceptions. I can't. I'm misunderstood a lot. I, I know I talk in rambling ways, and I just sometimes I, it makes perfect sense to me, but that's only because I'm in my head and I know what I'm thinking. So I'm connecting dots that you're not getting the dots to connect. And so it's a, it's, it's a misunderstanding sometimes. But I can't control what other people perceive. I, you know, you can't control their perceptions, right? right? But we would like their op- actions, their, their opinions uh, to be based on who we really are and on what we really say, right? right. You can't control what they think or why they think it, but you'd like at least whatever they're thinking and whatever they're saying about you to be based on the truth, what you really meant and and who you really are, right? So if that's true for us, imagine God when those who claim to know him best often misresent him the most. Praise the Lord. Look, let's go to Luke chapter 24 And uh, we'll read verses 31 and 32. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now, in case you're not familiar with this particular scripture, this is after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And these are these uh, two guys on the road to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, they're, they're grumbling. They're talking about, we thought he was the Messiah, you know, but he's dead. And, and uh, so maybe we missed it here. It, we were just screwed. And so they're all fouled up because they've dedicated the last few years of their life to this, what they believe to be the reality, only to think that now it's all bogus, you know. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. They don't recognize him, but he shows up and... And it says he talked with us, by the way, and he opened to us the scriptures. So what's happening here is kind of a, you know, a a disconnect, I guess. I mean, why, why did they make that statement? Why did they say that? Because Jesus didn't literally open a book to explain the scriptures to him. But he did show them how the book always pointed to him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7. Let 
Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So he comes to do the will of God. Within that context, he says, the whole book is written about me. Everything in that Bible is about Jesus. It's not about Matthew, Mark. It's not about Abraham. It's not about David. It's not about Jacob or Isaac. Or, it, it's about Jesus. Now, these people are in there, but they're all pointing to Jesus. That's what I found in the book of Ezekiel. Even though it started out being really depressing and kind of frightening, before it's all over with, I see Jesus in this. And all of a sudden, what had been frightening and discouraging and depressing becomes hopeful, becomes positive, it becomes something good. So what Jesus did, he didn't open up a book to them and start saying, now, thus saith the Lord. What he did was he opened the book to them and he showed them how that Abraham reveals Christ. Since Abraham had to leave his country, amen, and he had to go out on his own, Christ had to leave his. He left his heavenly home. He left heaven and he came here to another country. Amen. That's what, I mean, there's many, many things I'm just saying. That's just one example of what Jesus is probably saying to him. It's like Isaac. He showed him how Isaac re represented Christ. He had to carry his own wood to the sacrifice. Jesus carries the cross, right? Isaac is just simply a type of Jesus. He's just showing us that this is, this is a picture of me. Isaac did that at the request of his father. Jesus did the same. Amen? So by opening up the scripture in, in fresh ways, Jesus proved to them, and he does the same thing for us, that all scripture written in the Bible testifies of him. Amen? Now, I, I was reading a recent survey, and uh, it was in, in fact, it was in, uh, I think, Christian Science. I can't remember what the book was. But anyway, the magazine. But it asked for the top words that would uh, best describe Christians to other people. <laughs> this is not encouraging. And here's what they said. Judgmental, insensitive, homophobic, and hip hypercritical. Hallelujah. My concern isn't that Christians are unpopular because our faith isn't about winning popularity contests. Believe it or not, praise the Lord. My concern is the words that are used to describe Christians don't describe Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so what that suggests to me is that a lot of times Christians are not like Christ. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, huh? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus is doing something that most believers aren't. He came to save. He didn't come to condemn. Praise the Lord. His ministry was a ministry of reconciliation. Thirty some years ago the Lord told me that he had given me a ministry of reconciliation. I didn't have a clue. And believe me, early on in ministry, when I was first licensed and ordained in another organization, I wasn't very <laughs> conciliatory. I wasn't <laughs> reconciling many people. I was irritating the crap out of most of them and, you know, putting all kinds of demands, which I couldn't keep, but I thought, you know, that's just because I got some problems that they shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> right? So get it together and get your act, you know, straighten it up and so forth. But that isn't what Jesus came. That isn't how he came, and that isn't the way he presented God. He is the exact representation of God. There's not a difference between Jesus and God the Father. They were one and the same. Yep. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Uh, look at, look at, uh, let's look at John 3, 17. See, religion judges. It, it's, a, it's a thing about judgment. But Jesus is reconciling people to God, bringing people to, to, to God, bringing people back, people being accepted by God instead of rejected and judged. 
In verse 17, he says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, honest to God, if you just talk to the average person on the street, they, they wouldn't know where that is coming from. Because they'd say, he didn't come to condemn? That's all I've ever heard from the church. I mean, that's all I've ever heard from religion is you're going to hell. You're going to bust hell wide open. Look, at get your act together. Clean yourself up. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Start going here. And all of that. But that isn't what he, that isn't what he came. He didn't come to condemn anybody. He came so that the world through him could be saved. Could be reconciled. Praise the Lord. So he came to rescue. He came to redeem. He came to restore back to himself. Praise the Lord. So to be a Christian has really come to mean a person who likes Jesus as opposed to a person who is like Jesus. Amen. So it's not, it's not how moral my behavior is. It's not about my spiritual disciplines. I, I want to be a moral person and I want to have some self-discipline in spiritual sense. But that's not what it's about. It, that is not what God's dealing with us about. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. We need to remember this when we're talking to people who are not quote unquote believers. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now if you read previous to this, it tells you all the stuff that he went through. The, the beating, the, the the scourging, you know, the crown of thorns, the humiliation, uh, the, the crucifixion, the, the whole works. It all leads up to this, but it says, uh, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ went through all of that, right? But the when here matters just as much as the how. We focus on the how. He suffered this. He went through this. That's all true, and, and we ought to be grateful and thankful and aware of that. But the when he did it is just as important as what he did and how he did it. While we were yet sinners, he suffered all of that. Not after we got our act together, not after we cleaned up and straightened up and got, you know, uh, looking halfway decent and uh, behaving halfway decent. No, when we were despicable, when we were totally absorbed in ourselves thinking about nothing but what I'm going to get out of this and how much I'm going to have pleasure from this or whatever it might have been, that's when he died for us. Amen. That's when he did all of this for us. When we were totally alienated from him, when we didn't have any concern about him, while we were yet sinners. So, if we're going to be like Christ, just like God's love for us isn't based on conduct, our love for others can't be based on their conduct. You cannot have a double standard. You can't say, thank you, Jesus, for your grace, but I'm looking for something in you that needs to be corrected, that needs to be fixed up. It's like the guy who gets the million-dollar pass, you know. He owes the million bucks, and the guy says, hey, buddy, you're going to jail, your whole family, everybody's going. And, uh, and then, then he says, but you know what? I'm going to just give you a pass on this. I'm going to write a check and cover it for you. You're, you're free. He gets out, and he meets a buddy of his on the street that owes him 20 bucks, and he beats him up and has him put in prison because he wants his $20. That, friends, is a picture of religion. Yeah. Amen? It's not a picture of sinners. That's a picture of religion. God saved me, and now I want to place some demands on you. Paul said it himself. He said, look, you're... Peter, you're trying to put demands on these people that you couldn't keep yourself. But you think you're saved now, so you've got a right to harass everybody else. See, I'm perfect. Well, I am in Christ. I'm waiting for an amen right over here. but I, I felt it. I felt it in the Holy Ghost, but I didn't get a witness. Hallelujah. But I'm just saying... Look, we're not perfect in our natural who we are as human beings. None of us are. We've got problems. We've got issues. We've got flaws. We want to do better, we want to, and we do it out of a love for what God has done for us. But that doesn't make us perfect. And that's why people who are unbelievers see us as being hypercritical and hypocritical. 
We're hypercritical of them because we're hypocrites. Yeah. Say we, I'm just talking about religion. I'm not, you know, pointing my finger at anybody. But that's what religion does. It finds fault with everything else. You ever, you have you ever known somebody who just is always dissatisfied? No matter what you do, it's not enough. It's not good enough. It's not. Those people got a problem. You know what? They got a problem because they're so unsure of themselves. They look to be altogether different than that. They look to be very in charge, you know, sure, satisfied. And all. The truth is they're always finding fault with everybody else because they see their own faults so glaringly that they got to find something to make them look at least as good, if not better. Amen? It's just like the person always bragging about how many people they beat up. and all. I, I found over the years, after getting my bell rung a few times, they weren't always the meanest. They just talked about it the most. They wanted you to believe it so that you wouldn't challenge. So, so that you would just, sometimes it's true. So you've got to be very careful about which ones you decide, you know, uh, here's a big bag of wind, and then you find out there's bricks in that bag. Hallelujah. <laughs> But I'm just saying, generally speaking, people that are always blowing and bragging are the most insecure. They're, they're trying to convince everybody they got it all together and they, they just know it all. And, and, and the truth is, I listen and I listen and I listen and I just go, well, praise the Lord. Oh, to be like them. Why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? What's the matter with kids today? You know, I mean, that's how every generation feels that way. Look at the kids, my God, they're going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> well, I was pushing mine, praise the Lord, I, full speed as fast as I could go. But I'm just saying, we get these ideas and we have these images that are distorted, amen, because of our own insecurity. If you really know who you are in Christ, if you really have confidence that you are the beloved, that you are saved by grace, that God does love you, that you are his child, you can afford to be gracious to other people. That's right. Doesn't cost you anything. Jesus already paid the price for it. It doesn't cost you anything to love the person who isn't loving you back. It doesn't cost you anything to tell them about the love of the Lord, even when they look at you with that weird look in their face like you poor sap, you know, you're just an <laughs> idiot. You know? Why? Because it's real. It's true. How whether they accept it or don't accept it doesn't change the fact that it's the truth. Amen. Amen. Amen? So, praise the Lord. When, when we look at this, we need to be Christians who are more like Christ. Right. Now, I know that, that that sounds like a, a redundant experience because we believe that we get born again, we're created in the image of God, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us would assume that because we're Christians, we're already like Christ. But that's not necessarily the case. Spiritually speaking, yes, we are. As a spirit being, we're just like Jesus. But how we reflect that can vary dramatically between believers. And we know that's true. That's why we got 50,000 different denominations going out here that God didn't have any part in any of. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just saying it's, that's humans. That's just what humans do. We've got to have my group. And my group's got to be totally agree in agreement with me, or they're wrong. You know, they're, they're going to go to hell. They're going to, you know, so that's what people do. But Jesus was a person of grace. We read it in John 3.16 and John 3.17. He's a person of grace, a person of favor, a person who isn't making demands, but is giving. Amen? And so should we be then. I mean, I want to see people, I'm not just interested in filling this church. I'd like to see the church filled because it would represent that we're having some kind of an impact. That doesn't mean we're not having an impact just because the church isn't filled, but just for my own greed and selfish <laughs> desires, praise the Lord. Well, I've already told you we're not perfect, so work with me a little bit here. I'm just saying, we, we need to be honest about Jesus. We, we need to let people know how much God has done for them. Not what he's wanting you to do for him, but what he has done for you. 
Matthew chapter 22, and, and we'll read verses 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, I got a problem already. Okay, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Now, remember, the law is not just the Ten Commandments. There was like 670-some laws that Jesus refers to here. So they don't amount to anything compared to these two. These two, in fact, cover all the other. Now, the English word that we use is... Love, L-O-V-E, or as the singers sometimes see, L-U-V, love, praise the Lord. <laughs> but it's L-O-V-E, love, right? That's the one word that we use for love. So children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, wives, we don't love them all the same. We have one word that we call love, but my love for my grandchildren isn't the same as my love for my wife. It isn't greater or lesser. It's just different. Right? And same with children. Same with parents, brothers, sisters, friends. We just use love. We just say love, and then we've got to figure out then whatever that relationship is, what that word means, what it means in that particular relationship. But in the Greek, which is the language that the New Testament was written in, there are, and in fact, there are multitudes of words that are used for love. But the word that, see, there's a word for the love of family. There's a word for the love for a friend. There's the word for the love for a lover. I mean, there's just bunches of words, amen, to, to describe love. But Jesus was really very strategic when it came to his word for love here. And he used the word agape, which is only used in the Bible. Right. It's a Greek word, but you only find the word agape referring to that love in the Bible itself. You don't just find <laughs> it in Greek literature somewhere or, or, or in other Greek writings. And it's because agape is not predicated on feelings. Whereas every other type of love has some emotional context, some, some feeling involved in it, right? Right, right? So this word, agape, doesn't. Because it's a love of the will. It's, in other words, it's a decision that's made. David said, I will love the Lord my God. He made a decision. Yeah. Now, I can guarantee you when he's hiding out in caves and running from Saul and doing all these other things. He wasn't feeling a whole lot of warm and fuzzy, probably. He wasn't feeling a lot of love. He just made a decision, I'm going to love God. This is the God kind of love. This is how God operates. So he, God, when Jesus tells us, uh, gives us a command to love, he's not telling us to feel a certain feeling. That's where we get confused, especially as Westerners, because we think, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Oh, well, I don't feel terribly in love with God all the time. I, I, I don't want to admit. I mean, I do love the Lord. I just don't feel it all the time, right? I, I do love my neighbor. Well, I love one of my neighbors. <laughs> the Lord. But the other one, I ain't feeling nothing like love. Praise the Lord. So it isn't. A, it, that's why I'm saying it. He, he isn't telling us to feel a certain feeling because feelings can be managed, but feelings can't be commanded. I can control my feelings sometimes in the right setting if it's in public, praise the Lord. I can control them, but I can't command them. For example, be happy. I said be happy. Sh show me happy. 
See, I can't make you feel happy. I might convince you to smile or to, you know, kind of do something, but I can't make you feel happy. I can't command a feeling. Amen? You can't command them. So when Jesus commands us to love, he's not telling us to feel for other people. Now, this is a, this ought to be a good thing for you because I promise you, if you're anything like me, when I'm reaching out to somebody who I don't necessarily have any feelings for, I feel guilty because I don't really feel. You know, I'm talking about a stranger now, not somebody that I've met and developed some kind of a relationship with, but just somebody that's on the street, somebody just on the job, somebody that's just there, you know, just somebody that you would make contact with. I don't have to feel, gee, <laughs> I love you, man. You know, I don't have to feel it. I have to make a decision. It's different. And we don't have to feel guilty for not having some great overwhelming emotional feeling when we deal with the lost. We just got to make a decision to love them. Whether, whether you like them or not is irrelevant. You can decide to love them anyhow. And you don't have to worry about your feelings while you're doing it. Praise the Lord. The way we See, he commands us to look. He's not telling us, look, I want you to feel for this prostitute on the street the way you feel for your daughter. I'm not telling you to feel for this individual on the job the way you feel about a friend that you've had for 10 years. Right? Right? I'm not telling you to feel about this other individual the way you feel for, about your wife. Right. Instead, he's calling us to demonstrate a Jesus kind of love for them right. that is just a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Yes. You know, we hear the script all the time. We use the scripture. I've used it myself. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Right. Well, that's, we can confuse that and misunderstand what it is that's really trying to be presented to us here. Jesus didn't enter the world just to die. I mean, that was the ultimate goal, but that wasn't all that he was here for, or he would have just came and died the first day he got here. He came here also to show us how to live. Not how to be perfect as a God-man, but how to live as a human being, how to live as a new creature in Christ. Yes. We're not talking morality now. We're not talking about perfection here. Amen? He came so that we don't have to be nomadic citizens in a foreign land. Yeah. We're in this world, but we're not of this world, but that makes us feel, and it causes some people to go off and do really bizarre stuff and start dressing really strange and living in their own little communes and having their own little set of this and that and all this stuff because they're in this world, but they're not of this world. But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I'm not going to let you just wander around here like a bunch of nomads as if you don't have a home, as if you don't have citizenship somewhere. That's why he talks about preaching the kingdom. Amen? Jesus is a king. Amen? And the better we know Jesus then the better we know ourselves. Yes. Jesus is not just a problem solver. He's a king. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. He's not just a provider. He's a king. Yes. Jesus doesn't simply want to rescue you from bad habits, amen, and uh, bad behavior and regrettable circumstances and, and mistakes. Jesus wants to completely reshape and reconstruct the way you understand yourself. Yes. Yes. A citizen of his kingdom in the earth. Right. Yes. His word's the final word. Yes. His word's always right. Yes. He, he takes care of his own. Yes. Amen. He provides everything. So from this point on, the king's word is the final word. I don't, it doesn't matter what the doctor said. What did the king say? Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. doesn't matter what the bank said. 
What did the king say? Yes. Right? doesn't matter what the lawyer said. What did the king say? Yes. That's the last word. That's the final word. That's the only word that matters. So what that means is first you fire yourself and you hire Jesus. Because you will be in competition with him all the time for the job, for the top job. CEO of your life. Fire yourself right off the bat. Get it out of the way. Put him in charge and everything will be all right. Praise the Lord. Your vote doesn't count. Your opinion doesn't matter. He's the king of kings. I, I, I taught on a metaphor here. I don't even know if it was on a Wednesday night or when it was here a few weeks back, but about the game of checkers being like Christianity. And how many of you know you ever played checkers? Because I'm a, I'm a real mental thing. That's why I'm talking about checkers and not chess, praise the Lord. But when you get kinged, everything changes in the game. All of a sudden, you've got all kinds of freedom. You can move in all kinds of directions. You can make multiple jumps. You can do back flips. You can do all this stuff that you couldn't do before. It changes everything about the game. Now, he's kinged us. We have become kings and priests. Therefore, we have an ability, a function, a, a reality that the average man on the board doesn't have. They got a rigid routine, scheduled way of moving around the board, and everybody knows it before they make the next move where they're going to move to because they only got one or two options. But you, they don't know what's going to come next. You might go backwards. You might go forwards. You might go sideways. You might go three spaces down. You're a whole new creature. Everything's changed. He's king us. Praise the Lord. He's made us new creatures. He's given us abilities that we never had. He's changed everything about the way we operate. Praise the Lord. When you get under, you know, that's what they do. The king, they put another one on top of you, right? When you get under, when you get king, and you get under what God has placed over you, you can get over whatever comes against you. You couldn't before. You had to have all kinds of strategies. You had to be very careful. But once you get under, you can get over anything. Praise the Lord. Jesus is revealing God exactly as he is. Look at John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. You know, we run around all of our lives saying, King me, King me. And he's actually done it. And we're still sitting at home afraid to move. Because we don't realize what's over us. What empowering abilities God has given. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Come see. She was changed. And she wanted other people to be changed. But what we got to remember, and religion kind of confuses this issue, is that Jesus does the converting. All you got to do is have the conversation. If you'll just open up, they can be changed too. You're not going to change them. You don't have to measure each day to see how much you've changed them. You just have the conversation and let God do what God does. Just trust him to do the converting. Praise the Lord. John chapter 4, verse 39 through 42. 
Many of the Samaritans at that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, because we've heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You introduce him, he'll take over. Praise the Lord. What if, what if God wants you to begin the next revival? What if God wants to begin the next revival in you? What if God is going to reveal himself through you? I guess that uh, we ought to be like Jesus. We ought to reflect him as he really is. Not as religion has defined him, not as others might think that he is, but just the way the Bible. He loves. He forgives. He's gracious. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He didn't come to judge. He came to set free and, and reconcile. He didn't come to drive them at a distance from God out of fear, but he came to draw them in to his throne with an expectation of receiving something positive, something good. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Yes. And we've got them hovering around the outside of the church, fearful to even come into the building, let alone come to the throne of God. Yes. Embodying the grace of God, us revealing God like Jesus did. That's what I'm saying. For us, embodying the grace of God is the key for God being transmitted. You can't transmit a God that is not like you. In, you don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, you can't, I can't give God or, or reveal God to somebody if the God that I have is all screwed up, if he's all misunderstood. Because whatever I'm transmitting to you is going to be what I have already believed. So I've got to embody Grace. If I'm going to transmit the truth of God, the reality of God to somebody else. Right, right. And the truth is, that's the only thing God's really going to qualify. Right. That's the only thing he's going to validate right. is the truth about himself. Yes. The rest of it, we have to work really hard at making people afraid, uh -huh. guilty and ashamed. Right. Because God won't do it himself. Right. So, we aren't simply to live like Jesus. We need to experience the life that Jesus gives. We need to live out of that grace. And when we do, we benefit and the world benefits. Everybody gets blessed. Amen? So the question we have to ask ourselves is uh, what Jesus am I revealing? Is he a concoction of traditions? Is he my opinion? And then a little bit of truth mixed in? Or is it G the Jesus of the Bible? The truth, the light, the way, the love, the reality. If it's the Jesus of the Bible, then it's life-giving, Direction altering, destiny revealing. Praise the Lord. The Jesus of the Bible who initiated something so powerful that it brought the greatest world dominating nation to its knees. Rome collapsed. Jesus who radically changed my life. I know some would look at me from the outside and say, well, there's room for improvement, but it's because you didn't know me then. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The ones that knew me then know how radically 
Jesus has changed my life. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just saying I'm a whole lot different than I was when I come to know the Lord. And I can say the same thing about everybody that's out here. You've been radically changed. You're not perfect. You're still human beings. That's okay. From the heart, from the inside out, you have been radically, dramatically transformed. And you know it. The problem is the devil wants you to focus on the areas that aren't perfected. The flesh. Amen? It's a lie. It's a lie. We need to reveal the only Jesus that will change other people. problem is in a lot of places he's been lost he's been lost in allegiances to political agendas we know it in our own government in our own senate and house how they'll rush to have a prayer when some bad crap happens and then they won't let a Christian come in and even say a prayer we know it in our own schools where it used to be you'd stand up and say the pledge of allegiance and God we trust there would even be time for prayer in classrooms and in in study halls and so forth. Now, in half of them, you can't even bring a Bible in without having a major lawsuit. You can't even say the name of Jesus in our military, in a, in a, in a chapel situation. So we've got that. But then we've also got that he's been lost in folklore, where he becomes just a good, kind fairy. Lost in tradition. Well, it was good enough for Grandma to believe God was angry at everybody, and it's good enough for me. Lost in hate speech. Christian organizations claiming to be Christians, church groups that go and tell veterans coming back from the war that you should die, you should be dead. Attacking uh, pregnant women because they're making a choice about their, the future of their child. I'm not saying, I, I'm, I don't believe in abortion, but you don't beat somebody up for being stupid. Yeah. Right. You try to get them the truth, and you try to do it in love, or all you're doing is driving them to the opposite. Just, you know, I'm saying don't keep Jesus to yourself. Jesus lived totally reliant on the Spirit of God. Let's just be like Jesus. Right? I heard Peter talking about it this morning, and all of us innately respond to that. We know we get hyper uptight and tense and worried and concerned, and because we've been taught all of our life, if you don't, you're a dut. You're an idiot. You're an adult if you don't have some concern about what's going on. I want to just ask you this. All of your concerns and all of your worries, did it ever change anything other than your dietary? Trust the Lord. Trust the Holy Spirit in your life to open doors and close doors, to lead you and to guide you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Teach Jesus all over again. There are people who think they know Jesus who have no clue. And you know some of them. You went to church with some of them. (laughs) Praise the Lord. We know it. Just teach him all over again. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? Probably everybody knows this guy. He's a mess. He's been robbed, nearly killed, and destroyed. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's a, it's a type. It's a metaphor. It's a parable about this. What the enemy does to just every human being that comes into this world. And he's laying alongside the road. And the religious people are not just passing by. They're getting clear to the other side of the road because they don't want to have to even look at it, let alone deal with it. 
So what that story is really telling us is notice others. Just notice them. You don't have to be Jesus. Just notice them. Just make a decision to share the truth, the reality of who Jesus is. However that plays out, you, you, you know in the, in the context of the meeting, of the encounter, you know if this is a thing where you give somebody five bucks or ten bucks or whatever you happen to have, or if it's something where you just put your arm around and say, man, here's my number. Give me a call if, you, if there's anything I can do for you, if I can pray with you. Come to church. Well, let me buy you a sandwich. Let's go to lunch and talk about this. You, you understand what I'm saying? Right. Just be real. Right. Just don't judge and predetermine what God wants to do in that person's life and how he wants to do it. Just be available. Just notice people. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, you say, well, why? Because unless you notice them, they're not going to notice Jesus. You notice them, the next thing you know, they're seeing something that they haven't seen before. And it's not a hard thing to do. It's not a religious thing to do. You don't have to be a nut. You don't have to wave over them and do all that. You just be you. And when the opportunity arises, if prayer is the, is the way to go, pray. Maybe they just need to know that there is a God that's waiting for their prayer that he'll listen, that he'll respond. That God has a will to love them. Amen? He has a will to love them all. For God so loved the world. Amen? And we don't care what church they fill up. Just get them into the relationship with God. God will take care of the church. He'll take care of us. He'll take care of this if we don't make this the priority. Make them the priority and let God set everything else in the place that it needs to be. Amen? Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I just encourage you to go out of here. Amen. King. Amen. Praise the Lord. You might want to walk out backwards or sideways or whatever you want to do. Just know you're victorious. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There's no limit, amen, to what God can do in your life if you just let him. Amen. Amen. Uh, just an update. Uh, Joey texted me again. Every Caesar is in on the Bible are good and kids open their eyes a few times and they also have to grab their hands back because you're moving around while trying to reach the kids and stuff like that. So. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for their improvement. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. God has the last word in every situation. God bless all of you. You're dismissed. Thank you. Shake hands with the visitors. Tell them we're grateful that they came to be with us today. And shake hands with one another and tell them you love the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.